basically assuming causation <laughs> and and it's your it, it, it's the it's the sequence so you're saying well this event took place and then this event took place and this event took place but you're not actually ever telling us what's going on and what are the causal linkages so this is a what happened but not why it happened or the causal um so let's let's put that whole series of events and 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 way of thinking about uh evidence um of causal processes to the side Another way, and this is a perfectly legitimate uh, way, we just had a really nice presentation by Rosa about this, thinking about counterfactuals. Um, and then of course, this requires some form of controlled comparison, ideally with, a, with an RCT for each part of your, your process. And Rosa has a nice article where she really unpacks what that would then uh, could look like. Of course, the, the, the challenge, and I think this is also why she used the, the term thick or thin, is, is that, if it's evidence of difference making, your linkages themselves are black boxed. So, and this is, this is why a lot of, um, in the social sciences, a lot of what we could call case-based researchers have been talking about another type of, of evidence or kind of along the lines of mechanistic evidence. But unfortunately, so you're, many of you are familiar with the term causal process observations, CPOs, and this is Brady Collier, C. Wright, and others have, have, have worked with this, this, this understanding. And in, in their work, they, they define a, a CPO as, well, if you read this definition, it's basically anything. It's an insider piece of data that provides information about context or mechanism and contributes a different kind of leverage. Okay, well, the first question I ask is, well, what kind of leverage? But let's put that aside. Um, it does not necessarily do so as a larger systemized array of observations. It gives insights into causal mechanisms. Uh, and it's an, an indispensable alternative and or supplement to correlation-based inference. Okay, so far, so good. The problem with the literature on CPOs in the social sciences is, 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 is twofold. The one is theoretical, and this was also some of the critique uh, uh, of the term uh, causal process observation as it really, uh, as it originally came out, was basically what are CPOs evidence of? And if you read um, you know, social scientists using these terms CPOs, you'll be hard pressed to actually find what process or what is the process that this empirical material is supposed to be evidence of. And I'll give you an example uh, that, that, that uh, Rosa also was talking about this article by Tannenwald. And in this article, it's often used as an example of process tracing and good process tracing. Um, and and, and in, in particular, uh, she puts forward this, this empirical or a CPO basically saying, if norms, so the, the theory is norms matter for behavior or here, non-use of nuclear weapons. If norms matter, if there's this linkage, this arrow in between, we would expect to find people talking using what, what she calls taboo talk, or basically saying uh, using nuclear weapons on, on, in North Korea or against uh, Korea uh, or in the Vietnam War is wrong, right? So that's that, that kind of normative laden speech act. Okay, well, I can see how that could possibly be evidence of what's going on in between norms and, and non-user behavior. But the question is, you know, what is the actual process? And, and here, just, just you know, logically, you could think, well, norms could be linked to non-use through things like pressures from public opinion, but then decision makers talking in these morally laden terms would not be evidence of that process. It could be personal moral conviction. So I basically feel it's wrong. But if I feel it's wrong, why would I even have to, if, and that's, that's leading me to, to say, no, I don't want to use nuclear weapons. Why would I even have to externalize that? Why would I have to actually say it's wrong? Because I know it's wrong and I'm not even maybe even going to think about doing it. And, and so, so what it probably is evidence of is some kind of shaming process, but in the article, she never actually tells us how shaming works. So that then at the theoretical level, I just, you know, okay, taboo talk, but what is it actually evidence of? And let me just show you an example of what she could have done. So she could have actually unpacked the process. Here we have our cause, our taboo, or the norm against, um, against using nuclear weapons. 
we have an outcome non-use. And then we have a very simple causal process or, or, or mechanism, a shaming mechanism, where, and, and so you could unpack it as, okay, well, in a decision-making setting, okay, maybe a believer in the taboo has to use the norm. So that's the activity as a speech act to shame a proponent of use, right? Then evidence of that part would be somebody saying, hey, that's wrong. Of course, that's not evidence of the whole causal process because I could say it's wrong and, and everybody else says, okay, well, why don't you just shut up? Well, no, what happens then if, if, if a shaming process works is that then the proponent who's arguing for nuclear non-use or for, sorry, for nuclear use says, oh, I've, I've made a, a taboo. You know, I've, 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 I, I, I cannot argue against the, the morally laden you know, uh, statement because it clashes. And, and therefore, actually, what you would find empirically would be some form of account evidence that this, this proponent that was arguing, let's bomb them, st all of a sudden stops talking. And simply, in the, the, the whole issue of, of using nuclear weapons in this, in this setting disappears. So, so here, this would be kind of going to, to actually, like, this is what we should be doing, right? We, we should be both saying, okay, well, here's our evidence and here's what it's evidence of. This lack in, when they talk about CPOs, lack of telling us what it's evidence of or what is a process and never actually making it explicit also has epistemological uh, or epistemic problems in the form of how can I evaluate the probative value of evidence when I don't know what it's evidence of? And, and just briefly, I'll, you know, so, so often people spend a lot of time uh, talking about Bayesian logic in the social sciences and, and case studies and how we can evaluate the problem of value. But how can I evaluate it when I don't know what, it, what, what this empirical material, what process it's evidence of? And let me just use an example where Tasha Fairfield in an article uh, has a confessional. And she says that this is evidence of a causal process linking legitimacy appeals to tax, oh, that's supposed to be tax reforms. Um, and the evidence then is she has a confessional from a right-wing party deputy, simply, and this is the actual statement she got in an interview. And when I look at that and, and trying to evaluate the probative value of, of what this statement is, it's, it's difficult because it's compatible with multiple plausible causal processes. For example, this linkage between legitimacy appeals and tax reforms, the linkage could be that you make an appeal to legitimacy and then that, that resonates with voters and then there's this kind of bottom up pressure for voters that drives politicians to do a tax reform. But it could also be maybe somebody makes a legitimacy appeal and it's almost like an anticipatory. So the, the party leaders say, oh, well, okay, well, then we have to do that because we think that voters are gonna want that. And that would be a very different process. So the same empirics can be evidence in this instance, perhaps of, of multiple processes linkage. And how can I figure out what the probative value is of this evidence without knowing, again, what it's evidence of? And this is where I think that the, we need to then take a step back and then think about ontology, right? So what, is, what are we, because you can't just say something's evidence. Right? It has to be evidence of something. And this is where I think welding it to, the, to the, a productive account of, of, of causal processes or the systems account, as, other, as, as I've, I've termed it sometimes, uh, I think is very productive. And this is every, you know, everybody in, this, in the seminar knows this, the you know, process unpacked into entities engaging in activities, making explicit the causal logics, binding parts together, right? The core challenge, and, and this has already been raised by, by several of the speakers earlier, was the social dimension, right? There's a dis difference between a natural causal process and a social causal process. We're sentient beings. We engage in social relationships. I mean, this is, of course, um, you know, a huge uh, body of, of work. Um, um, you know, some people say that the, the, the social is so fundamentally different, you know, the Beaver and, and, and Blakely, Bever and Bakeleys and others argue that the social is so different that, that we have to think about and the methods and tools we use to analyze social is completely different than, than what we would use kind of in the, in the natural sciences and the types of claims, et cetera. Other people would say, well, um, 
there are differences, but you can adapt. But one of the core differences, of course, is, is if we're talking about a social causal process, it's also important to know, as, as our interpretivist friends or, or would say, it's like, what is the game? What's the social game being played? Um, so there's a social dimension of causal processes that becomes very relevant, both at the ontological level, but then this has evidential implications as we move along. And those are the ones that I'll try and, 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 and pull out a little bit. So this just as an example, when we're thinking about um, uh, causal processes at the ontological level, how does the social matter? Well, capacities for entities to engage in activity, which is of course a critical part of our theorization of a process, can be dependent upon uh, the social context. So for example, uh, personal connections. Um, so, so a lobbyist might be the activity and the ability to, for example, talk to a politician and have that politician listen, might be depended upon the social relationship between those two actors. So, so the same activity without that social connection would probably, the, the, the politician would say, okay, well, that's really nice. No, thank you. Um, but if they have a social connection, then the politician, that's the, so that's the, the impact, you know, the, 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 your capacity to do something might be impacted by, um, by the social context and the causal impact. Then again, moving on to the next, uh, so, so an activity is not, if, if it doesn't do anything, if it doesn't link to a next part of a process, of course, is, 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 is just doing something. But in part of a causal process, an activity is the linkage and it's linked to the next entity it impacts. Um, so, so there your ability to actually impact your activity to actually have this kind of effect also can be dependent upon things like, for example, having trust. Uh, of other actors. Um, so, so, so interpretivists would, would, would say that, well, when we're studying the social, it's not just like the natural world. We also have to ask questions like, what is the social game? What are the rules for interaction? And, and how does this kind of game change over time? Um, and this, this, of course, makes social processes a lot more relational, ephemeral, and, and, and very socially con, you know, context uh, specific, which of course raises huge challenges for, for working with this kind of evidence. Okay, so, so now I'm gonna then think more about the epistemic side of this and how do we move from, from a pro developing a good process theory, and that's a, a whole, whole question in and of itself, um, to actual empirical material that can act as evidence of this causal process taking place. And of course, we have this idea of, of mechanistic evidence, and, and I think this is a, a very helpful term. Uh, and thinking of mechanistic evidence defined as traces of activities taking place. Um, uh, you know, although, although one of the things that I think we often overlook uh, is, is that there is also a distinction between what evidence is in theory and actual sources. And I'll, I'll so this is inspired by um, a Bayesian philosopher of science, um, Sober, um, who, who operates with these kind of distinctions. Um, and so at the theoretical level, so we have an entity engaging in an activity, right? That's one part of a causal process. And then we want to evidence that. And then you can ask yourself, okay, well, this activity, what kind of evidence generating process would be related to that activity? And in theory, what kind of fingerprints or propositions about evidence might be left in a given case? And then, of course, there's the whole question of, of observations and the actual sources. So that's the more empirical level. We have evidence in theory and what it in theory can tell us. But then there's also the question of actual sources. And, and Sober uses this framework to, to develop, a, I think, a quite compelling account of when absence of evidence is evidence of absence. And it's only in, it's, it's only in, a, in, a, in particular circumstances um, in relation to these, these, these two steps. Okay, and then the questions that we're asking, and these are you know, Bayesian-inspired uh, questions, 
uh, about uh, the probability of value then that would be associated. I'm not going to spend time really uh, talking about that. But let me just first focus on this moving from, from theory to propositions about evidence or evidence in theory first. Because um, mechanistic evidence in theory then is basically saying, well, if an activity took place, what kind of mechanistic evidence would we expect to be left in a case? What's the evidence generating process? And here, um, in, in my own work, I've been trying to think about what kind of manifestations this, you know, what could, would, what could act as, as, as potential evidence and have developed a, a very pragmatic um, influenced by evidential law, basically saying any, anything that tells us something is relevant evidence. So it's very pragmatic, but then distinguishing between you could call patterns uh, sequences, uh, traces, uh, so, so just, just the mere existence is proof, or account evidence, this would be content of documents, etc. Okay, then you can use Bayesian logic to ask the right questions. Okay, but let's, let's get back to the, to the core about the, the social. Um, so the difference between this kind of traces or this mechanistic evidence and in theory in the natural and the social. So in the natural science, mechanistic evidence would be observational just as it is in the social. Um, so observational evidence of what activities took place. And we would want to also, when we're studying the social, to understand what activities took place. But in, when we're studying the social, it's important to also understand kind of the social context or what game is being played, what social game is being played. And this is, and this is drawing heavily on, on interpretivist then uh, ideas, um, is, is, is in this instance, because we're both interested in the kind of the what took place, did the activity took place, that is what you could be called experience distant understanding. I can go out and observe that an, a lobbyist talked to a politician. That could leave traces. In a, in a lobbyist register, I could go in and say, yes, they met on this date, great. That took place. But what's the game? I cannot, as a researcher, then it would say the experience distant. I, uh, I'm not a, a, a participant myself in the process. I'm, I'm a researcher. I, this, so this is not my own social experiences that I'm drawing on. And the interpretivist would say, well, you also need to tap into the social dimension. Actually, often interpretivists would say the experience distant is not interesting. Where I, where I think that this is, uh, where, I, where I'm drawing on saying you have to do both is more a realist approach, uh, but I don't think realists have ever actually told us how we can wed uh, experience distant and experience near evidence. Because the experience near evidence would be not only did the lobbyists meet, but would be understanding what is the game in which this activity is taking place. What is, and how, because I cannot as a researcher just say, well, that's the game you're playing. I need to, I need to talk to people and I need to figure out what kind of game they're actually playing. Um, so let me just use an example. Um, so a part of a process, an activity and, and an entity. So an entity could be something like uh, an epistemic authority, right? So, so an expert, somebody who's trusted. And, and in a, in a, in a policymaking uh, setting, let's say um, there's a crisis and uh, politicians are saying, okay, well, what, what is this crisis? How do I understand the problem or problems we're facing? Well, then an epistemic authority or an expert that is trusted could then maybe, for example, put forward and say, well, this is an economic crisis or this is a health crisis and et cetera, et cetera. So putting forward a problem diagnosis. There would, of course, be a social dimension of this activity. And it's the level of trust and connections between the epistemic authority and the policymaker. And you would have to understand a lot about that game and probably also in that particular, uh, among that particular group, you know, what's the, what's the prehistory? What, you know, how does this, how does a typical expert politician game in this setting typically take place? Um, of course, if it was a, a Donald Trump, maybe the, the expert would be completely ignored. Um, whereas, whereas if it's an Angela Merkel, I think the expert would be 
there would probably be a lot of trust and connection between, and, and, and so it's important, so they could, you could have the same activity, but it could have very different implications and effects depending upon the social. Okay, that, of, that is, is, is evidence in, 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 would say, in theory. That, and we need to tap not only into what is the activity, but what is the social game kind of within which this activity is taking place. And then the question is actual sources. And here, the, the, the social is more understanding what empirics, particular empirics, mean in a given context or case setting. So, so of course, if I just put forward a proposition, I would expect to find um, taboo talk. Taboo talk, per se, is not evidence. I need to go out and collect actual empirics um, and evaluate, you know, did I actually find the, the taboo talk I was looking for. That's the observational process. And, and, and here, the, uh, also a critical distinction is that understanding what something means. So in the natural sciences, if, if of course, you have to be an expert in, in your given field to be able to interpret what a particular molecule is doing or whatever it is, um, what that means. Uh, it could be some kind of transfer or, or, or whatever. You, you, you need to, of course, have, have knowledge. But the, 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 the type of knowledge that we would also have to understand what a given piece of empirical material means in the social also has this experience near dimension to it. Basically, you know, if we find an observation, does it mean what we think it means? Uh, of course, there's basic like historians would do, uh, you know, can we trust the sources? But interpreting what a given observation means in a given case context is, and, and, and this is the experience near, uh, is, is also really important. So when I go out and I do, I do interviews, so my, my practical kind of hands-on uh, case study research or process tracing uh, deals with elite decision-making in the, in the EU. And, and there, um, I'll, I'll sometimes find empirics, and I will have no idea what it actually means, even though I'm an expert in, in you know, EU politics and this kind of, and I need to talk to them, to, to the people that I'm interviewing and say, you know, what does this mean? Okay, I have a skeleton draft that this, art, this actor put forward. What, what does that mean? I, and, 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 and I need to tap into their understandings of empirics uh, and, and what particular pieces of empirical material uh, mean in a given, given uh, context. If you don't find an observation, of course, you also have to ask yourself, why not? You know, could, did you have even access? Uh, can, can, we trust, can we trust our sources? Um, here, the whole question of experience near is maybe not as relevant. Um, simply because it's often more a question of access. Um, yeah. So moving from, from, from process theory to, to actual empirical material, how, what, what can this actually look like? So, so this idea, again, that, that we were, you know, the entity activity, we're trying to make propositions about mechanistic evidence, and, and then the actual observations. And let me just show you an example from, from, from my own research uh, was, was published relatively recently um, where I'm looking at analogical reasoning and I'm trying to use process tracing um, to understand um, how, how, how decision makers make, make choices in, in, in very complex situations. And, and I don't wanna walk through the whole theory just, just to say that um, or maybe the cause is that, is that there's some kind of crisis and, 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 and decision makers have, have diagnosed or somebody has diagnosed uh, authoritar authoritatively what the problem is that they're facing during this crisis. And then the analogical reasoning, but in particular where, where I wanted just to show you an example of this kind of two-step part and then pull out maybe a little bit about the, the social is, is that in an interaction between, so you have some epistemic authorities, people that are trusted, um, they use analogies when explaining what solutions worked, might work to, to policymakers. 
So for example, they'll say, well, um, you know, we're facing a crisis that's just like uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and, 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 and the decision to not save Lehman Brothers, right? So, um, so, so, so there, uh, not saving Lehman Brothers or not doing something would actually be, this could be like a negative. So basically taking, saying the solution chosen in that situation was simply bad. Or it could be, well, it worked there, uh, the positive, you know, uh, this is a case of this. There's a solution that worked there. Um, you know, we've seen this in the COVID-19 uh, economic side of the crisis where, where decision makers um, draw back to, to the lessons of 2008. And you find a lot of people arguing, well, in 2008, we were facing a big economic crisis, then we stimulated the economy and that, that helped uh, avert a, a Great Depression. And you find similar uh, reasoning then, kind of drawing on that analogy, uh, using the, the response in, in 2008 as a positive source case, basically saying, you know, it worked then, uh, this is the same kind of crisis we're facing, the pr same problem. The solution in, from 2008 would work also now. Um, okay, that's the theory side of it. And then the question is, well, what, what could act as evidence of this kind of uh, using analogical reasoning? And there we put forward a proposition about potential mechanistic evidence. Um, so for example, for part two, we write, we should expect to find analogical justifications we expect the justification will tend to have the following rhetorical structure. And there we put forward then clear ideas about what this kind of argument might look like rhetorically in theory, right? So this is, uh, an, an abs this is not evidence, actual evidence, this is just this evidence in theory. So having recognized the problem as A, problem A was dealt successfully in source case with solution B, and then solution B might work uh, in the target case. Of course, there's a lot of, and, and I, we um, could have done a lot more in the article actually thinking also about the social uh, dimension and the, and the context of this evidence because this is very much in a game in which these epistemic authorities are very trusted, right? So, so, um, so, so that, would be, that would be a critical part of, the, of, of, of thinking about this as evidence. And then, so we have this proposition here, this is up here. And then the question is, well, okay, well, what could it actual sources then look like? And that's then when we move to actual observations. And, and here, this is just one example, uh, a, a German member of the ECB, the European Central Bank's executive board saying, I fear we're not learning the right lessons in Europe. We're facing a vicious circle. So that's the problem. Um, where domestic banks, blah, blah, blah. In the US, so he's saying, well, there's, there's other countries where this problem in theory could have been, but they don't have it because, and, and they have another solution. So they say, well, in, in the United States, this feedback loop or this vicious circle doesn't exist because federal institutions can act as shock, shock absorbers, blah, blah, blah. So in Europe, we need to look to the US for inspiration and say, this is why I've called for a European bank resolution authority. So, so, and there we would, we have to ask ourselves, so what, what, in this particular context, what does a German member of the executive board saying this actually mean? Uh, and of course, this is, has a particular person, it's a particular, you know, in a particular uh, setting, uh, you know, can we trust them? But also, what does it mean? You know, who was it that said it? What was the social context? And this is something we, we unfortunately also, we didn't really have time to, to, to spend too much time in the, in the article, but was still very important for us to be able to interpret this, uh, the, kind of what this meant, what's the probable value of this actual piece of, of evidence, and here we think it's a, it's actually given. Also, it's a German member of the executive board uh, is 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 quite strong um, confirming evidence that 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 part of the of the process actually uh, took place. I said that um, I had more questions than answers, <laughs> and. You know, I think this distinction between evidence and difference making mechanistic evidence is, is really applicable in the social sciences. But evidential pluralism, as far as, under, you know, just a, um, 
combining evidence of difference making mechanistic evidence, for example. Uh, and then, and then we're for thinking about mechanistic evidence and just saying, well, we can also use that in similar ways in the, in, when we're studying the social. The challenge is that is that um, is 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 the, is the very nature of the social that we're dealing with individuals, you know, our, our entities are individuals or collective actors that have emergence. Um, the activities are always taking place within a particular social game. Um, which raises a lot of these issues regarding experience distant when we move to the empirics, experience distance versus experience near, and having to try and wed those and, and make those kinds of evidence, types of evidence, and, 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 and um, to, to function together makes it then, if then you think, well, okay, I can also leverage evidence of difference making on this question. Okay, that, and then we're all of a sudden using experience distant types of evidence. And how can we then get them to communicate in this respect? I think, um, yeah, again, I think there's, there's more questions. You know, there's so much that we do simply do not know. And, and as I said earlier, you have people like uh, interpretivists like, like Beaver and Blakely and others saying, uh, the two cannot cannot ever meet, right? There's the experience distant, the experience near, and they're two completely different uh, ways of thinking, completely different, uh, in, you know, completely incompatible with each other. Um, you have realists like Sayer and others saying, well, we can wed them together, but they never tell us how to do it. And, and, and so this respect, I think my talk is, is, is exemplifying, trying to exemplify some of the difficulties in thinking about mechanistic evidence when we're working in the social sciences, given that we're studying the social and then meaning that we need to be able to, 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 to both leverage experience distant and experience near uh, understandings and, 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 and evidence. Um, but how we how we how we leverage them together is basically an an, an, an I think an unanswered uh, question. Um, before I leave, though, I, I think uh, just to to maybe also go full circle, uh, returning to um, uh, some form of evidential hierarchy. So so if we are thinking about evidence and mechanistic evidence, and again here this is not not putting forward uh, how we actually do it as far as the wedding of, of, the, of, of the evidence uh, of, of that, that captures the social and, and the experience distant experience near kind of distinctions, uh, how we get them leveraged together. But let me just put forward the, the, the maybe cr some criteria for what we could say would enable us to make strong causal inferences within this kind of productive account about process. So at the, very, at the theoretical level, we have productive continuity, unbroken chain of activities in which causal linkages are made explicit, right? So, so there's no real social um, so much going on there, but it's more when we start moving to the level of evidence. Uh, so, so strong causal inferences are when you have direct and unique mechanistic evidence for each of the activities of each of the parts of your process but it also has to be able to capture the social context of, of action. And then the actual evidence then would be, you have trustworthy sources, you have full access to the empirical record, you have valid, but then the, the, the critical is that you, through combining experience, distant experience near uh, analysis of what particular pieces of empirics actually mean, you have a valid interpretation of what that observation means in a given social context. And only when you have all three of them together could you then say we're, we're actually able to make a very strong causal inference um, about a process, a social process in a given case. And then that would then lead me to some kind of parallel hierarchy of, of, um, of, me of evidence uh, gains from different methods. So, so on, on our kind of, or you could say the variance based or the assessing counterfactuals, uh, the gold standard then would be, or the platinum standard might be the meta study, um, which has an externally uh, valid, validity uh, dimension. And then we have lab experiments and then, and then decreasing degrees of control 
over uh, confounders that lead us then to eventually you know, correlations instead of causation because of the lack of control for confounders. Whereas what I've been talking about here is, is a case base within case using mechanistic evidence to, to, to make causal inferences about processes in which your, your, your gold standard on the internal validity uh, dimension would be a process tracing case study that also captures uh, the, the, the social um, and then your, 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 your true platinum standard would be then with the external validity, multiple uh, process tracing case studies, and then you can move down down uh, from there. The reason, just on, a, just on the side, you might be confused why I have small, small end comparisons are better than medium end comparisons. And this is uh, 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 an idea from, from uh, in the social sciences from, I would say, the case-based uh, kind of approaches that say the, the, the sm fewer cases we have, the more we can get to know them. And therefore, the better we can actually try and understand what's going on within them. But if we have a lot of cases, it's just going to be garbage in, garbage out, unless you have an incredibly homogeneous uh, population of cases. Okay. I just have some then some, some, some suggestions for, for further reading. So I've, you know, just a little uh, uh, plug for my own book. Uh, although I would say, um, and this is where my research is now moving, um, I have not, in this book, I don't spend as much time thinking about the social as, as I think I should have. Um, so, so what I'm presenting today is, is basically reflections on what I should have been also thinking of and doing in this book, uh, the second edition from 2019. Um, I've also uh, written a, a, some articles about mixed methods or mixed methodology. Um, and then I have a couple examples here of, of process tracing in the social sciences um, that I think are pretty good. Um, well, I have to think my own research is good, but. <laughs> uh, and for those of you that, that just thought the, the, the whole two level or the two step and, and that was, this is an absolutely fantastic article uh, by Sober uh, about uh, evidence and, and, and working with that. So I just thought I'd put that up. Okay, um, I think I'll stop here and I really look forward to hearing your questions and comments and, and um, input. Thank you. <laughs>